Sarmis Egetusa Regia, ancient Greece, once the capital and most important military, religious, and political center of the Dacians, a civilization that flourished before their eventual decline to the Roman Empire. Erected upon the top of a mountain, the fortress, comprising of six citadels, like countless other areas claimed as ancient Rome, possesses evidence of a far deeper history. This additional evidence would suggest Sarmis Egetusa Regia is indicative of an ancient antediluvian site, one once strategically placed and subsequently rebuilt upon. The site displays severe erosion, with many larger megalithic stones now moss-covered and returning to an unidentifiable geological state. The solar stone, however, a relic also of tremendous age, has experienced a conservation effort later in its life. The linking wall of the disk's blocks precisely marks the north-south latitudes, with an appendix used upon the surface as an ancient sundial, with the shadow of the tip of the gnomon depicting the time of day and year, its shadow touching the disk's prolongation when the sun culminates in the south. Additionally, like Stonehenge or the countless neolithically claimed earthworks and hinges across the world, were seemingly obsessed with the solar precession. The ingenious builders also, somehow, incorporated into the dimensions of the disk and position of the gnomon knowledge about the change of the sun's position during the seasons. Thus, during the moon of the winter solstice, the year's longest shadow would have been positioned to the eastern edge of the stone. While during the summer solstice, the shadow would only reach the edge of the disk, making the solar stone an incredibly accurate and ingenious eternal celestial calendar. Who built Sarmi Zegetusa Regia? Where did such detailed astronomical knowledge come from so far back in human history? Were they a surviving remnant of a once far more capable yet post-apocalyptic civilization? We find such possibilities highly compelling. There are many ancient monuments found all over the Earth which possess extraordinarily precise solar and lunar alignments. Ingenious designs, often many thousands of years old, constructed from stones sometimes quarried, cut, and transported to the sites from many miles away. This movement of megaliths was accomplished using techniques or technology as yet not understood, and to date, many of these megalithic stone placements are perceived as near-impossible feats of ancient engineering. And although many impressive examples of monuments which track the sun can be found to have originated from many different civilizations, the most notable of antiquity, most famous for a seemingly obsessive level of monuments devoted to the observing of the sun's path, was undoubtedly the Neolithics. One has to wonder, why was there such a fixation? Was the motivation for this mass of undertakings of a tragic nature? Was it out of fear? Fear created by a memory of a catastrophic event, possibly involving the sun's powerful emittance of radiation. Maybe they experienced the consequences of an ancient warming cycle. We may never know. Yet the most important question in our field is not why these volumes of solar-aligned relics were created, but how. How did our ancient ancestors, claimed as having existed over 10,000 years ago, construct such precisely positioned granges, hinges, barrows, and sun daggers? Something we have previously covered, an incredible type of sundial, which tracked a sunspot across the wall of an ancient cave, with each month, solstice and new year precisely marked out across the walls. Yet the sundials in question in this video are a group of far more familiarly designed dials left by the Neolithics. These sun-tracking dials can be found across the Neolithic sites of Ireland, Scotland, Orkney, and England. First discovered by an American by the name of Martin Brennan, a 39-year-old from New York. Not only did he discover the true function of curbstones located in Noth, codename K7, K15, among others. He also cracked the earliest form of writing while studying the Irish Stone Age artwork. Earlier this year, a theory emerged on the internet by writer and journalist Ben Gagna. He suggested that there was an image of a swan on curbstone 15 at Nonth. 
He claimed that while examining a photo he had taken of K-15, he flipped it upside down and saw something no one had ever seen before – the faint but unmistakable image of a swan in profile. The true meaning or purpose of the curbstones had for a long time been heavily debated within certain circles. The intriguing cup and ring marks had been known of for some time. Yet as previously mentioned, though the most popular theory of the design on K-15 was the claim that it was the depiction of a swan glyph, this hypothesis was rejected even before Martin's unarguably accurate translation was discovered. Martin identified the sundial while examining a passage mount in the Boyne Valley. And although sundials thousands of years old have been excavated throughout Europe, many specialist individuals reviewing Martin's finds believe that the sundial discovered in County Meath is the oldest and possibly most important ever found. According to Martin, who has been studying megalithic Irish art for the last 10 years, Ireland's megalithic tombs are suffering from appalling neglect. Some of the most important passage mounds excavated previously have been ignored or conveniently completely sealed up. Martin's discoveries are undoubtedly remarkable and are of tremendous value to our ongoing deciphering of ancient antiquity and its past civilizations. It is a journey of discovery we find highly compelling.